All right, we are now going to uh, turn back to our study of the Odyssey. I'm assuming that you have it in front of you. I'll be in Odyssey 1 today. As, uh, as we again want to begin our study by paying particular attention to translation issues. So we'll, we'll start there. We are going to look at just two translations. We could have done a lot more, but I just I, I didn't want to give as much time to it. After we talked about the Iliad, we now are going to uh, make some observations. I want to begin, first of all, by our just looking at the opening lines of the Odyssey. We will do this in the same way that we kind of looked at the opening lines of the Iliad. And we will want to ask ourselves about some of the uh, major themes that will be introduced in these opening lines. Let's go ahead and look at it now. We will begin with our uh, reading of Fagel's, and uh, then we'll look at Sam Butler's translation as well, kind of see what Butler had to say about this one. Uh, I'm, I'm with you in your volume on page 77. You should be there now. Sing to me of the man, muse, the man of twists and turns, driven time and again off course, once he had plundered the hollowed heights of Troy. Many cities of men he saw and learned their minds. Many pains he suffered, heart sick on the open sea, fighting to save his life and bring his comrades home. But he could not save them from disaster, hard as he strove. The recklessness of their own ways destroyed them all. The blind fools, they devoured the cattle of the sun, and the sun god wiped from sight the day of their return. Launch out on, the, on his story, muse, daughter of Zeus. Start from where you will. Sing for our time, too. Uh, Figgles in his translation, of course, in that final Sing for Our Time too, is trying to give some sense that the Odyssey is a poem worthy of consideration even in the postmodern era. Before we start into any detail here, uh, let's listen to how now Butler does uh, works with these opening lines as well. And again, I, I didn't make a copy of this for you. I'll just, I'll just read this one for you. Here are the opening lines from Homer's uh, Odyssey from, uh, from Butler, all right? So the same thing. By the way, as I read this, go ahead and stay at Fagel's and read along, and then you can see some of the adjustments, changes, etc., to language, etc. Take a look. Tell me, O oh muse, of that ingenious hero who traveled far and wide after he had sacked the famous town of Troy. Many cities did he visit, and many were the nations with whose manners and customs he was acquainted. Moreover, he suffered much by sea while trying to save his own life and bring his men safely home. But do what he might, he could not save his men, for they perished through their own sheer folly in eating the cattle of the sun god Hyperion. So the god prevented them from ever reaching home. Tell me, too, about all these things, O daughter of Jove, from whatsoever source you may know them. The opening lines of Butler's translation. Now I want to begin by making some kind of general observations about the ways in which the Iliad and the Odyssey have been compared. One of those ways has been to compare the two epic heroes. Right away you could probably do this in your notes and let's ask that you do. Really briefly, what is the difference in your estimation between an Achillean kind of figure and an Odyssean kind of figure? What are the primary differences between the two? We can obviously see similarities. They are both epic heroes. They are both strong in the battle, etc., etc. They're both interested in women, it's obvious. But what are some of the differences between the two? How is Achilles, as a type of character, different from the Odyssean character? And now I'm going to ask a question that you're going to need Fagel's uh, book one to answer. From the opening lines, what do you see as similar between these two epic poems, about these two epic heroes, Achilles and Odysseus? And what do you see as quite different? Okay, and if you didn't bring your copy of Iliad with you, then you know, you'll just have to try to remember what, what it is that was said 
about Achilles in the opening of the Iliad, and what's similar about the opening remarks of Odysseus, and then what's different, what's quite different. Okay? And as we work together, we'll kind of answer some of these questions. I want to begin, though, by pointing out the most obvious invocation of the muse. Jot down again in your notes what that is. What is the invocation of the muse? What are we doing when we invoke the muse? Do you remember, Mr. Wilson, what that means? If you're invoking the muse, what are you doing? You ask the gods to tell the story. Asking the gods to help you tell the story. Notice it's not for Fagels to tell the story, but rather to sing the story, trying to remind a postmodern readership that this uh, poem was an oral presentation for many, many years before it was ever written down. It was kind of sung or chanted or whatever. Notice the second thing that we'll say about this. A uh, man, this Odyssean man, a man of twists and turns. A man of twists and turns. Jot down what you think that means. A man of twists and turns. What do you think that means? And is that something that would be said of Achilles? And if so, and if not, why not? A man of twists and turns. By the way, uh, Butler calls it ingenious hero. You might put that in your notes, an ingenious hero. Mr. Batson, what do you think that means? What is Butler trying to get at with him when he calls Odysseus ingenious? Clever, good, let's write that one down. This one's going to be important for us to understand the distinctions between Achilles and Odysseus. Miss Sin, what do we say when we say, if Odysseus is ingenious and clever, dare we say it, deceptive and a great liar? What is Achilles? How, what's, what's the adjective you want to give to him in this regards? How would be the, what would be the difference? Is Achilles just as good a liar as Odysseus? No. Is he as good a deceiver? No. In fact, Achilles seems to pride himself at the beginning of the Iliad on standing up for the truth. You're going to take my girl. I'm going to tell you how I feel about that. Right? I think as we already pointed out, Odysseus probably handles that situation much different. Oh, Agamemnon, sure. Yeah, sure. You want the girl. That's no problem. Yeah. Come to the tent. You can get her. I know where your tent is, though. What do you mean you know where my... No, no, it's all right. I, I'd love to help you out. That would be great. No, right? Odysseus plays with language in ways Achilles just doesn't seem capable. You going to say anything about intelligence here, Mr. Kelleher? Which one of the two do you think of as more intelligent, Achilles or, or Odysseus? He is. Let's, that's a great way to say it. He's very linear-minded, isn't he? He has an objective. He only sees usually one way to solve that objective, to accomplish the goal. Right? Odysseus, on the other hand, quite different. Continue. Back to Fagels. Notice the next thing we're told about this Odyssean character is that he is driven time and again off course. One translation will call him a man of constant sorrows. We'll get to that line in a bit. Of course, for those of you who are, oh, brother, we're out there fans, you know, of course, that the Cone brothers are retelling the story of the Odyssey in their fine offering. If you are not familiar with this film, I highly recommend it to you for a number of reasons. Um, but the idea of travel, right, the Odyssean character is a character who travels a lot. But he's constantly, Fagels tells us, driven off course. What does that mean to you? On purpose. Say it out loud, Varney. On purpose. What's on purpose? Like the gods. Yes, that's right. He constantly wants to get to a point, some place, and the gods keep screwing with him. Not allowing him to get where he wants. Dare we say it, the gods frustrate Odysseus a lot. Let's say it out loud. Odysseus, like Achilles, is a frustrated character. No doubt about that. 
Okay, no doubt about it. They're both frustrated men. Of course, feminist scholars of these poems will point out the way that they're both sexually frustrated men, which will make some sense given they're both of their biographies, right? But we will point out, Odysseus seems to have a different kind of view of women than does Achilles. Jot down how that's so for you. Again, this is why it's so important that if you haven't read the Iliad and the Odyssey, you have at least read thoroughly part four of Hamilton so that you can at least kind of get some sense of how these two guys view women differently. How does Achilles and, uh, and Odysseus seem to view women differently? They're both, by the way, notice, willing to fight to the death for a woman, right? Achilles willing to fight to the death for Bryces. It's not the same fight. It, it's not the same, though, Schreiber says. Good. Why, why is it different, Mr. Schreiber? How do you see it as different? You're absolutely right. How is it well, different? Odysseus is fighting for his wife, but... Achilles is fighting for a prize. Big difference, right? Big difference. How does Odysseus think about women when it's not his wife? Is Odysseus a faithful husband? Oh, yeah. Just kidding. Well, Schreiber says that all depends on how you define faithful. He does what it seems is his, is his nature. Although Odysseus will defend his extramarital affairs as being necessary. With Circe, he says, she was a witch and I had to do it so that I could get my men back. She had turned them all into, which is what some women say they know about men all along. Sorry about that. And uh, the only way they're gonna get turned back into men is for him to sleep with her. He does that for two years. But in his defense, He's kind of doped up and he doesn't realize time has passed so quickly. Which may happen if you're, for example, sleeping every night with a Victoria's Secret model, I don't know. But it seems that time passes quickly for Odysseus and two years has come and gone. And oh yeah, we've got to get out of here. What about Calypso? What do you want to say about the fair Calypso? For seven years he enjoys Calypso in the cave. What's going on with that extra marital affair? Is there any way to defend that one? Ms. Anderson, can you defend that one at all? Can you defend any of them? <laughs> he didn't, he didn't have anywhere to go. I mean, really? There's nothing else to do for seven... What are you going to do for seven years? <laughs> Ms. Anderson points out, wait a minute, Penelope for 20 years, at least 10, has turned down all of those all those suitor guys who want to try and marry her, right? Okay, so if Penelope can say no, why can't Odysseus say, uh, yeah. would Achilles say no? Or are they two of a kind in this regards as well? How do you see Achilles different in terms of his treatment of women than Odysseus? Do they both use women? Any way you want to see this is different. Are they the same? Typical men. What do you think? Shrive, do you see any difference here between those two guys and the way they treat women? Achilles ostensibly is fighting for what right in regards to Bryce's? I mean... Schreiber was gentle when he used the word prize. Let's be fair, we're not talking about something in the bottom of a Cracker Jack box, okay? When we use the word prize here, ostensibly Achilles is going to take this woman, use her sexually, and then get rid of her. That's all that's about. Sorry, Brad Pitt in the film Troy. There is nothing even closely in the text that suggests that Achilles has any romantic tendencies. We might say any romantic tendencies of any kind. The only one that he seems to have real anger about in the, in the loss is, of course, Patroclus, his pal. Achilles is through and through a fighter warrior type. As Mr. Kelleher, I think, aptly pointed out, very linear. He, you can see Achilles coming from a mile away. You know how he's going to behave because that's how he always behaves. He is very much about the truth, about right. And in his culture, getting Bryces is right. Doing with her as he wills is right. It will become an enlightenment debate many, many years later. Wait a minute, don't women have rights? Aristotle had fundamentally said, no. No, they don't. But that's just the way, they, that's just the way it is. 
Uh, and anyone to argue otherwise is, of course, arguing a silly argument for Aristotle and a, dare we say, it, dangerous argument. Achilles would have kind of agreed with Aristotle on this count. Odysseus is different. He sees women, yes, as a tool, no doubt, but he also sees women as something to be, we might even say, tended, if not pleasured. That's fairly clear. When Calypso is told Odysseus must leave in, 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 in Odyssey 5, she is not pleased about that. In fact, she tries to convince him to stay with her, which seems to suggest that she cares for him on some fundamental level, which seems to be something different than what Bryces would probably feel about Achilles. Okay? Maybe we should say it this way. Odysseus and Achilles both elicit loyalty. Odysseus has found a way to elicit loyalty not only from his men, but also from his women which it doesn't seem Achilles is so easy with. Of course, he doesn't really care. You don't have to agree if you're Bryces with Odysseus. In fact, he might see that as just okay, right? It is what it is. As opposed to Odysseus, who seems to have more interest in, you know, at least trying to give some sense of adequate pleasure, if not sexual, certainly companionship, we might say. But if the authors are switched around? It's a fine point. If you're following Butler's argument, that a woman writes the Odyssey and therefore will describe an Odyssean character, an epic character, that seems to take into greater consideration some of these issues. Notice his relationship with Athena. He has a really interesting relationship with Athena, doesn't he? For those of you who have actually read the Odyssey, you know there's lots of bantering that goes back and forth. At times it seems almost quasi-sexual, but it certainly is more like what you would expect old pals to have, man, woman, pals, you know, back and forth, he lies, she's like, wow, that's pretty good, you're pretty good at that lying thing, not bad, you know, that kind of thing. Go back to the opening lines of the Fagel's translation again. Sing to me of the man, muse, the man of twists and turns, driven time and again off course, once he had plundered the hollow heights of Troy. Let's point this out. Odysseus is given credit for the fall of Troy. Now Aeneas will, of course, tell us in the Aeneid when he tells that story, that long story to Dido in Aeneid 2, in Aeneid 2, that it was Odysseus who came up with the plan for the Trojan horse. That is, of course, a extra or post-Iliadic story. That story is not told in the Iliad. The Iliad ends and Troy's walls are still standing there. You know, Achilles is still alive at the end of the Iliad. It's Hector who's, who's gone. So notice here we're told that it was because of Odysseus that they notice we're told the hollowed heights of Troy, right, were brought, were, were plundered. Continue. Many cities of many saw and learned their minds. Many pains he suffered, a man of constant sorrows, as the translation, the most famous, the Rouse translation will say of him, right, as we're familiar with, again, from O Brother Waratah. Uh, what do you make of this many of cities of many saw and learned their minds? What do you want to say about that? What, is it, what does that mean to you? Learned their minds. Yes. What does that tell you? Their ways, their customs. He, wasn't, he was there for a while. Yes, he spends time. Keep going, though. This is interesting. Odysseus seems to be a guy who wants to know about other people's culture. Notice Achilles. He's at the walls of Troy for one and only one reason. He's going to fight, he's going to get done, he's going to win. That's his plan. We're told that Odysseus is a different kind of cat. Notice, he is our first anthropologist. He is our first psychologist. He's interested in the culture of others and in their minds. But why? Why is Odysseus so interested in other people's culture and other people's minds? What, so he can write a textbook for a graduate symposium? Uh, no. Why is he interested? So he can publish papers, academic papers on these... No. Why is he interested in knowing these people and their cultures? What would you say? What would, he, what would you say? Odysseus is always looking for what? Maybe he kind of wants to take advantage. That's it, exactly. Odysseus is about Odysseus and making sure that Odysseus gets his. Now, you could argue that so is Achilles, but Achilles' mode of going about it is fairly, as Mr. Keller said, linear, predictable. 
But Odysseus is a different kind of cat entirely. He understands if there's two ways to get what you want. There's a frontal way that's fairly obvious, but there's another way. No, 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 you're my friend. I, I am your friend. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's how things work around here. You're right, right. If we were in a different place, it would be the opposite, but now you're going to give to me. See how, how it works. But notice on top of this, he's constantly of suffering. The, the word suffering is for Fagel's the key word of the Odyssey, and it certainly is for anyone who reads this poem. Suffering. He is a sufferer. Heart sick on the open sea, fighting to save his life and bring his comrades home. But he couldn't save his comrades. Uh-oh, this sounds a lot like the Iliad, the Iliad how? Notice the opening lines of the Iliad. We're told that because of the rage of Achilles, what happens to a bunch of his men? Down to Hades they go. Same is true for the opening lines of the Odyssey. Down to Hades, a lot of these guys went. He lost all of his pals, all of his soldiers. But notice, keep reading in Fagel's, he couldn't save them from the disaster hard as he strove. Notice who's to, who's to blame. The recklessness of their own ways destroyed them all. The blind fools. Why? Well, they made the gods mad, namely Apollo. They ate the wrong Big Macs, right? And in the process of eating the wrong Big Macs, they upset Apollo, and they're all going to be drowned. Notice, wiped from sight. We're told one more time, launch out on the story, start where you will, sing for our time too. Let's now go to this man of constant sorrows, and I want to begin on page 155, roughly. And we are in book five. It is significant that we don't see Odysseus for four, for four books of the Odyssey. Unlike the Iliad, our storyteller is going to set up our story. Ostensibly, we have three different locations that the Odyssey will concern itself with. What are those locations? Well, we begin and open where? Where does the poem open? The Odyssey opens in what location? Athena. With Athena and the lie. Where do we open? We are on Mount Olympus. Why are we on Mount Olympus? <clears throat> Athena has decided Odysseus should be allowed to come home. She goes to Daddy Zeus and says, I think we should let him go home. Daddy Zeus says, I don't know, my bro Poseidon is kind of torqued off at Odysseus. Why? We don't know. Why, by the way? What is it that Odysseus does that upsets Poseidon so much? He, 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 blinds, he blinds Poseidon's boy, right? The Cyclops, remember? Polyphemus is blinded. Uh, and the arrogance, of course, that Odysseus will have shown, oh, Poseidon just can't stomach so that's the first place. The, gr the group will have to have a little vote to ultimately allow him to come home. The second location is, of course, Ithaca, where we're told that the son of Odysseus, Telemachus, has now grown up, where the wife of Odysseus, Penelope, has now begun to fear that her husband is not coming back, and where a group of bad guys slash suitors want to marry Penelope, one of them. Now, let's point out, this has nothing to do with the fact that Penelope is stunningly hot, and that's why they want her. No, no, no. Those guys wanting to marry Penelope is all about who gets to run Ithaca. In other words, there's a vacuum of power. The king, Odysseus, has left. He hasn't come back. All the other heroes have come back from the walls of Troy and had, you know, and had their returns. We're familiar with the return of Agamemnon, who gets jacked, etc., etc. But Odysseus never got home. Part three, place three. Well, here we are on page... Uh, 155. I'm reading uh, roughly at, at, at around line 90. As for great Odysseus, Hermes, the messenger god who's been sent to tell him, you know, you get to go home, couldn't find him within the cave. First time we see this great epic hero, look at this. Off he set on a headland, weeping there as always, wrenching his heart with sobs and groans and anguish gazing out over the barren sea through blinding tears. The first time we see Odysseus, how do you want to qualify him in your notes? Some students have said, he just doesn't look very heroic. The first time we see him, he's sitting out on the edge of a rock, looking towards Ithaca, sobbing, crying. Interesting. Odysseus is told on page 157, 
it's time you get to go home. Calypso's told him it's time you get to go home. She will call him at line roughly 175 or so, my unlucky one. Don't waste your life away, she says. Long enduring Odysseus shudders on page 157, right at the end of the page. Long enduring Odysseus shudders, and he broke out in a sharp flight of protest. This is the very first time Odysseus speaks. What is it that he says to Calypso, who has just told him, you get to go home. Good news. Look what he says. Passage home? Passage home? Never. Surely you're plotting something else, goddess. What does this tell you about Odysseus and the way he thinks about women? Because Odysseus is a liar to women, he never can what in regards to women? He never can believe them. He never can trust them. Not even a goddess. He says, yeah, right. You're lying to me. You're trying to get me. You're trying to use me. Which is, of course, exactly what Odysseus is so good at. Users always are worrying about being used. Right? Odysseus always worry. Keep going. Urging me in a raft to cross the ocean's mighty gulfs. Notice her response on 158, lines 200 and following. What a wicked man you are, and never at a loss. What a thing to imagine. What a thing to say. She can't believe it. She's like, oh, how dare you? You don't even trust me. I'm a goddess, and you don't even trust me. We continue on to page uh, 199. Uh, I'm sorry, 159. Roughly uh, lines two, uh, 235 and following. Ah, uh, great goddess, worldly, Odysseus answered, don't be angry with me, please. All that you say is true, how well I know. Look at my wise Penelope. She falls far short of you, your beauty, stature, she's mortal and all. And you, you never age or die. Nevertheless, I long, Fagels, I pine. It's, a, it's an interesting verb. I pine all my days to travel home and see the dawn of my return. Hmm. On to page 162. One, he's, he's, he's on his little raft, along comes Poseidon to try and drown him for reasons, again, we find out later in the poem. And Odysseus will speak at roughly line 330. Take a look at these lines. Wretched man! He's about to drown. What becomes of me now at last? I fear the nymph foretold it all too well on the high sea, she said, before I can reach my native land. I'll fill my cup of pain. And now look, it all comes to pass. It's almost like you can't read these lines without whining. Oh, this is what I always thought would happen once I left the shore. Oh, I'm drowning. Oh. Some of us will say, this is the hero of this epic poem. Interesting. What monstrous clouds King Zeus crowning the whole wide heaven black, churning the seas in chaos. Gales blasting, raging around my head from every corner. It's certain now, right? Notice, uh, notice how this, this first passage opens for us. Odysseus is like Achilles in what way? Mopes. Mope. Wallows in self-pity, mopey. What do you find interesting? What do you want to say in your notes about the fact that the Greeks invent heroes that are kind of powders? Does this surprise you at all? They're morose. They're powder types. They get kind of angry and then they, they worry. Oh, no, this is terrible. You want to play the game of thinking about any of our modern movie heroes and whether this kind of approach works or not. Can you imagine Jason Bourne, or now his new sidekick type, in the middle of some bad thing going, Oh, no, I'm so sad. Interesting. Question. Do you see this as a form of weakness? This, oh, I'm so sad. Do you see it as a form of weakness? Is this a heroic trait when a guy cries? Do girls like guys who cry? If there's a Crying is okay if there's a reason. A good one. Is not being away from your, or not being with your wife a good enough reason to be crying all the time? Not over and over again. Not over and over again. Oh, I'm so oh. What about you're about to die, being drowned to death? Oh, I'm so 
She goes, no, I don't think so. It's too, a little too wimpy. You're a little too wimpy. This guy is a little too wimpy. What's interesting is that we will see Odysseus in a full range of emotions. Let's say it that way for your notes. Full range of emotions. He will run from great kind of wallowing in self-pity as Batson said, to being unbelievably egotistical and confident. He kind of goes all the, he goes through the entire range, doesn't he? All right, thank you. We'll uh, come back to Taco Odysseus some more later.